to me, my X-Men. X-Men 97. I didn't know if I was going to do this one. And I'm going to try and keep up with it going forward because this was pretty interesting. Now, a uh, little bit of background. I was around when the 90s cartoon uh, was a thing. I did watch it a bit. I was both at the time, and especially as time has gone on, not nearly as enamored with this as a whole lot of geeks of my generation were. So many of them swear by it, and I honestly think that is down to two factors. One, an absolute banger of an opening uh, theme, and two, massive nostalgia goggles. Like the original, first of all, it's, even by 90s standards, it's cheap. It is visually quite janky. And here's, here's what I'll say. I think it served very well as an introduction to the X-Men for anyone who was not already reading the comics. But as someone who was reading the comics at that point in time, one of the only times that I was and was like trying to catch up on some of the major events uh, in X-Men history, um, seeing these things adapted pretty well to a 22-minute cartoon uh, format, but adding nothing to them. And if you want to point a comparison, and like, maybe it's unfair, but it's the obvious one to make, Batman the Animated Series felt very much like Batman, but rarely did direct adaptations of storylines from the comics, and therefore had the ability to surprise me. With pretty much any given episode, it was almost guaranteed to not be pulling something directly from the comics. Granted, I also didn't know Batman quite as well, but like what I knew of Batman, I'm like, okay, I know these characters, but I also know that's not quite how it happened before. That's that's different. This is a different way. Whereas the X-Men uh, cartoon was much more like pull directly as close as you can. And under that mandate, it did it well, but it meant for someone who already knew those stories, I didn't get all that much out of it, all things considered uh, at the end of the day. Like, I did still watch it a bit, but it it definitely, I don't, I don't think it holds up. Like, other than that theme, I really don't think it holds up very well. So, with that in mind, I was kind of, the, the announcement of this made me go, I'm really happy for the people who are excited about this. I'd like, I'm not even in a state of like going, I don't think it's going to be good. Just like, I'm not sure I'm going to get any more out of this than I did originally. And I, it did take me an episode or so to sort of slip into the mindset of what this is doing. Because what this is aiming for is to kind of be what you remember the 90s cartoon being without being a fully accurate um, representation. So like, obviously, the visual quality and the animation quality is better. Not so much better, but it is better. Um, so th there is that. Um, and the storytelling is a little bit more uh, sophisticated, a little bit more mature. And I don't mean like mature as in mature themes, audience be warm. But I mean, it's it's tackling some of the more complex aspects of the X-Men and the history in the comics. And it's tackling them pretty well. Like it's taking on things that are harder to do well in the time period they have allotted them than I think what the original was doing. Um for the most part, at any rate. And it's, so, it's that, but at the same time, there is a lot of carryover of stuff that, like, if this was being made fresh today for the first time, this wouldn't be <laughs> how that is. Some of that's the voice acting. A decent chunk of them are pulled in from the voice acting for the original. I didn't think the voice acting in the original was all that great. Um, and it's fine here. Uh, there are, there have been a couple recastings and there's a, there's a few, um, differences, but like, it's still trying to evoke the nineties era of dialogue and delivery, which it succeeds in. Don't get me wrong, but I also don't have a huge amount of nostalgia for that. Uh, personally speaking, I know other people do, and I'm sure some of them, those who aren't mad that it's suddenly woke now, like, do you no X-Men at all. No, clearly you don't. Or if you do, you have never thought of it as anything more than a surface level, which means you have failed at media analysis. But anyway, setting all that nonsense aside, um, I'm sure that people who are not like that um, have, you know, taken a great deal of joy of how well it evokes the time in which uh, the original was made. 
Um, those aspects I had to kind of get used to and be like, okay, I need to just accept that this is what it is in terms of some of the voices, uh, the delivery of lines, how on the nose some of the writing is, even as there are scenes that deal with some stuff with like a surprising amount of grace and subtlety. There are other scenes like, wow, that's clunky dialogue. But again, I can, I personally wouldn't give it a pass and like, a, that's okay, but I understand why it's like that and why it's going to be okay for other people. But this is a case where I think the strengths are outshining the issues. Um, and most of the issues are things I just have to roll with. Like, given the mandate of what this show is, these things were going to be this way. And I either need to accept those things or I need to stop watching because they're never going to go away. I opted to accept them. So while I'm noting them here, I don't intend to dwell on them and I don't intend to bring them up again. So I'm going to talk about the first three episodes because uh, that's what I've seen and that's what's out at time of recording. New episode is out tomorrow. Uh, don't know why I went with that choice of pronunciation. Uh, and I don't know what I'm doing now. Anyways, um, so first episode establishing Professor uh, Xavier is dead. That was, uh, I think that was a really good call for giving this a very clear separation and a very clear, this is a more complicated situation just inherently by the fact that the person who was the guiding force is gone. Like that's a really strong storytelling choice. And I think... Um, that's a good way to open. And so we have that, um, and we have uh, like a little bit of stuff with the Sentinels and Bolivar Trask. That feels a little bit more like, um, I'd say the first episode is, I think, the weaker of the first three. Not that it's bad, but like, it feels like it's tying off the Sentinels uh, kind of obligatorily. Like, the Sentinels and Bolivar Trask were a big part of the original. Like, let's establish where those things are at so that we can now do other stuff. <laughs> it it kind of felt like, a, let's let's put that stuff over there so they know why we're not dealing with it uh, for the next stretch of time, which probably a smart thing to do. Um, but it's it's less engaging than what starts happening in, happening in say the second episode where we have. Magneto. So first of all, like Magneto inheriting the school, I'm pretty sure that has happened. He's at least been a teacher at the school. I can't remember if he inherited it. Like it's it's also pulling from material that like has gone on since I stopped paying attention to X-Men. So it has a little bit more of an ability to surprise me. I'm not expecting that much because it is mostly taking its cues from storylines from uh, 90s, 80s, 70s. And that, but the whole thing with Magneto, and I really like the way he's played, where, like, he hasn't changed his mind. He doesn't think that he was wrong. But he's, to honor his friend who's dead and who handed him the keys to a kingdom that Magneto has previously rejected, he's going to try. He's going to try within his limitations and his tolerances to honor Charles and to do it the way he would as best he can. And I think that struggle is handled really well because you never lose that sense of righteous and justified fury. Like, especially when he's, when he's talking down the judges, he's like, he, he's not wrong. Like, he's, ve he's very correct in his statements, but to see him do that, like, and try and hold himself back, even though he still feels so strongly that he was not wrong in what he'd been doing up to this point, but um, it's time to try something else. And it's time to try the thing that his friend who died said he should try. And the the whole thing with the storming, of, of where this trial was. This trial was weird, like, because there was, like, a three-judge panel. Uh, there were no... And there, the, there didn't really seem to be a proper prosecuting attorney. They had that woman that the X-Men have contact with in the government, but she was up there with the judge. I don't, like, I don't know what that was trying to, trying to be. But, you know, having a bunch of people shout, traitor, storm the building, boy... <laughs> did that did that feel like loaded imagery and smartly because i think 
that is a parallel worth making. Because people like the, you know, Friends of Humanity in-universe is a hate group. That's what it is. So paralleling them to some of the more extreme actions of politically motivated hateful mobs that uh, are in living memory right now, yeah, that is a level of boldness I would not have expected the 90s cartoon to have. Obviously, January 6th hadn't happened in the 90s, but whatever the equivalent was, I, I don't, I wouldn't have expected that to even try and tackle it. This not only tries to tackle it, it tackles it pretty well, especially that moment with the executioner when he's got Scott and he's getting prepared to, to try and kill Scott. And he says, you know, you know what it really is? It's not even the powers. It's your whining. I have a hard life too. I don't whine. I'm so sick of your whining. Speaking as uh, a visibly queer uh, trans person, uh, yeah, boy, did that, did that really remind me of the kinds of things so, so many hateful people tell themselves. Oh, I don't even hate you for what you are. I just hate what you're doing. I hate that you're whining about it. I hate that you're saying I'm a bigot because I won't use your correct pronouns. I hate that you say I'm a racist. I hate you for pointing out that you are oppressed. Yeah, they want us to be oppressed and shut up about it. So that was good. That was real good. Third episode, I was once I realized, well, once we got to the end of the second episode and we go into the third one, I'm like, oh, crap, they're doing Madeline Pryor. That made me real nervous because Madeline Pryor is a messed up situation in the comics that I'm like, what are they going to do to try and make this work? Because short version in the comics, how Madeline Pryor was handled, uh, people who hate Cyclops, who hate Scott and think he is a horrible human being, usually the first thing they will point to is Madeline Pryor and how he treated her. And they're not wrong. Chris Claremont um, had said that the original idea in um, in Madeline Pryor was that, yes, it would be revealed she was not the, uh, the original Jean Grey, but that he would come to terms with that. He'd move on from that. He'd realize he'd built this new life with this woman. They have a child. And Jean coming back was something that he had to come to terms with and move on from. Unfortunately, Chris Claremont didn't keep writing the, the book indefinitely. And when other people came in, they decided that Scott would abandon his wife and child and go back to his old girlfriend. And that him doing that would drive her crazy and make her a villain. So I think they did a decent, I think they did about as decent a job in trying to thread the needle of handling Madeline Pryor A, better, and B, in 22 minutes. I think this is about as good a job as you could have done. I'm not entirely sure it was uh, a story worth doing, but then again, uh, the classic, uh, the the original version of this did introduce Cable, and, and if you're ever going to tackle Cable and, like, circle around and explain his deal, you are going to have to deal with Nathan. And if you're going to deal with Nathan, you have to deal with Madeline Pryor. This, this uh, interpretation of that story had the benefit of knowing the problems that happened as it was being written over a long period of time and was able to, because, like, the whole Mr. Sinister thing, that was a retcon. Uh, introduced later to try and patch over some of the yeah <laughs> some, some aspects of the whole thing. So um, introducing it right off the bat, like no, that's what's going on. And when she goes villain, it's at his prompting. Like she's upset. Yes, who wouldn't be? Her husband and the father of her child is suddenly acting like I don't know if I will stay with you now because this other person. I think that's who I'm supposed to be with. So uh, her anger is justifiable, but when she tips over into full villainy, when she becomes the Goblin Queen, um, that is at Mr. Sinister's prompting. And I think that helps a lot. And also sort of resolving it, have her come to terms with um, just moving on and having to find her own life. Um, it like, it's a little rushed. It has to be, it's 22 minutes, but that's, that's pretty decently done. That's about as well done as this story was going to be in the time allotted. So hats off to them on that. I think at present, I think episode two is the best of the ones that have aired so far. Um, as far as like the characters, they, they're pretty much what I remember them being. 
uh, in the 90s cartoon. They are very accurate representations of the uh, existing characters. I think Beast is my favorite. I just, oh. So, something about him, like, leaping on a monster's back and, and quoting uh, bits of, of the Jabberwock and then saying, like, I'm not actually a fan of Lewis Carroll. Like, he's, I like Beast. I like Beast a lot. Hank's great. Um, but, you know, Wolverine is a bit... Uh, the, the That's sort of where I mean, like, it's very 90s in the voice work. Um, and Scott's a bit bland, but he's always been a bit bland. Um, Aurora is good, a little overdramatic, but also Storm has always been a little overdramatic, so that works pretty well. As far as um, new and or recast characters go, um, I'm really liking Morph. I know Morph did come back in the cartoon. I think I bowed out uh, or was close to bowing out around the time that that happened. Not that I ever had hit a point of like not watching that again, but just like I moved on from it. Um, so I don't really remember if he had rejoined the team proper, but I like that they remember his strong connection to Wolverine, which was like right there from the very first episode of the original show. Like these two mattered to each other and like they have this great fun teasing relationship. I also love that they use Morph to basically cameo a bunch of characters who will probably not appear in the show, but like, hey, here's Lady Deathstrike and Spiral and Magic and like this... This is fun. This is a really fun way to use a shapeshifter like him is to use him to depict characters that we're probably not going to see otherwise, but like for a hot minute, want to be kind of cool to see them and see them kick some butt. Yeah, it is. That's a really fun way to use a shapeshifter. So I dig that. I dig, I, I'm liking Morph a lot. Roberto has not got a lot to do. He's a little bit spoiled brat, which yeah, it's Roberto that, that, tracks. Um, I know they recast the voice on Jubilee, although like from what I heard, I haven't double checked this, from what I heard, the original voice actor actually declined to return so that they would uh, so that they would have the ability to cast an Asian American voice actor in the part. I hope that's true. That's what I've heard. Um, and if so, good on the voice actor and the new Jubilee is doing a good job. And I think actually pairing her with Roberto, that's uh, that's a real good fit because like he's kind of filling the role she was initially she's you know he's new to the thing he's not entirely sure what's going on and she gets to kind of ride that line between not being a full-blown x-men but having enough experience that she can help somebody who's new to it oh the other thing i'll mention is uh the third episode while i do think overall the second episode is better when the third episode devolved into madness because uh madeline Pryor went all out that was some good stuff. That was some good, horrific imagery. Again, going places that I don't think the 90s one ever would have gone, even if it had the budget to do it. Um, so, yeah, some cool stuff there. I'm enjoying this. And it's not that I ever thought I'd watch it and go like, oh, that's bad. I thought I would watch it or try it and be largely indifferent. I'm, yeah, I'm feeling this. And I'm going to make an attempt to try and review new episodes as they come out. Not necessarily the day they come out, because I don't know what time they drop. I don't know if they drop them in the morning or in the afternoons. I don't know. That that might that might affect whether, like, because I know there's a new episode tomorrow. So that might affect whether I get a review out tomorrow or Thursday. But one of the two will happen. X-Men 97, first three episodes. What do you think about them? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Patreon pays the bills and is what enables me to do this as my living. Even if you can't help me out that way, links to other stuff down in the description. Like, share, subscribe. They all help me out. Don't worry too much about it, though. We, uh, we take a relaxed attitude around here so you can come on back next time you need a break. Damn it. <laughs> I was trying to hold that back. Time for me to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfula, Goddess Elida, Oliver B, Tarak, The Thing That Goes Doink in the Anime, Ruth, Solitary Pictures, Ulrich Bogdan, Loki Eris, that was a new one, that's why I paused, uh, Melinda Walters, Jen, Auntie Kate 808, Becky Sparks, Fernabi Likes Poodle, Robin Powell, Twisted Wishes, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casper, Dave Hall, Quite Bearish, Rosalind Bennett, <laughs> Pau Barabajagal, and Marigi. <laughs> if, if you want to support me as well and help keep these little buggers fed, um, check out my Patreon. Thanks so much. <laughs>